Hello, I'm Greg with Primal Rights. We're going to start this video off today with a very harsh truth, and that is that there are very few manufacturers of brass that can actually create a very high quality brass. Now, this statement will probably not come as a surprise to many of you, but then there are others still that would think, well, okay, well, there's so many companies manufacturing brass you would think that they that they would go out of business if their product wasn't good. To counter that argument, I would remind you that not everyone is asking for the same things from their brass. And for instance, a uh, competition pistol shooter might not be looking for the same integrity of brass as a very demanding precision rifle shooter. The guy that's just going out to the range on the weekend and AK-47 mag dumps into the berm probably isn't too concerned about the brass in terms of its accuracy or consistency. They're just looking for it to provide some reliable functionality. So there are all manner of different shooting disciplines that would not require the same level of brass that I require. I can tell you with no uncertainty at all that my performance as a precision rifle shooter started to improve dramatically when I started to understand just how important the brass was to this equation. Early in my career, obviously, a lot of emphasis was being placed by everyone else on the type of bullet that I was shooting or the powder selection, load development techniques and such. But what was really not emphasized was the brass. And I still remember it to this day. When I first started really pursuing this, I was given a recommendation to try some Lake City long range brass for my 308. And at the time I was shooting almost exclusively 308 Winchester. This recommendation had been given to me by someone on a forum that was very well respected, very well placed person at a very high profile company in the industry. So based solely on their recommendation, I think I bought 500 or 1000 pieces of the Lake City long range brass. Despite every effort I was never able to get the kind of performance that I was expecting. After being very disappointed with those results, I went and purchased basically like a hundred pieces of every single brass manufacturer out there. Now keep in mind folks, this was quite a long time ago. We're talking well over 15 years ago and the marketplace was very different than it is now. There was not a whole lot of different brass manufacturers at the end, but 308 being very popular, NATO cartridge, it did have quite a few options. So I bought like a hundred pieces of all of this and I loaded it up and shot it. And to my surprise, I was met with some brass producing an extraordinarily lackluster result. And then other brass was absolutely amazing. Like my rifle was shooting like it had never shot before with any combination of components that I had ever tried. There was two things that I realized with that discovery. Number one, the people in authority and positions of respect that were advising other shooters on what to do very likely did not have the same kind of expectation or the same goal in their precision rifle shooting as I did. So I learned very quickly that, well, this advice that you can find on the internet was just, generally speaking, not very good. That largely has not changed. It is still not very good. The second thing that happened as a result of that, this really launched my discovery process with brass. It caused me to look at everything with fresh eyes and try to learn just exactly what needs to be done on the brass side of things in order to make sure that I was going to be having a desirable result downrange. So I started becoming a brass expert, not just on which companies were able to make the best brass, but at the time I didn't even know how to determine what good brass was. And so I had to develop an entire process that would allow me to discover whether or not the brass that I was working with was of an adequate quality for me to be working with in the first place. It really is important that you understand that the brass itself and the way that you treat it in your process can either make or break the entire system. If you are misunderstanding of how to do something on your brass or you are not purchasing the correct brass, then every other effort that you will have in every other avenue of this discipline will be a failure. It's important that I don't understate just how important the brass is in the entire equation here, 
because it is a very malleable substance and it's it's kind of alive. From firing to firing, it changes. When it's brand new and you fire it, there's there's a significant period of, of change that goes on from the first firing to the third or fourth or fifth firing. And if you don't understand what's going on with this brass, then you can waste a tremendous amount of time trying to get some level of performance out of it that your batch of brass will just simply never ever under the best conditions with the best treatment be able to provide. So in this video today, I'm gonna to teach you exactly how to determine whether or not you're working with a batch of brass that is good or bad. For the purposes of this video, we're going to ignore the obvious that you could have your brass sent out to a uh, laboratory to be evaluated. You could get all kinds of information in terms of the um, thickness of it, the, the metallurgical makeup of the brass, the grain structure, some relevant information of the hardness in, in the various different places on the case. But we're going to skip past that because I'm going to assume that most of you don't have access to a laboratory like that. And the other thing to remember is even the laboratories that are kind of dedicated to offering services to the firearms community, they probably do not have world-class shooters that are there that are tying the results of what they're seeing in the lab to performance on target. So realistically, it needs to be a shooter that is evaluating this brass, a very good precision rifle shooter. The other thing that I'd like to get out of the way is just because someone told you that such and such manufacturer of brass is good doesn't mean that your batch of brass is good. There are no individual manufacturers that are flawless. There's always the chance that even though they normally and can be generally relied upon to create very consistent brass, there's always the possibility that you could get a batch from them that is not good at all. A batch that is not representative of their product that happened to slip through their quality control process. So don't listen to advice on what brass is good and then just operate under that assumption. You have to develop a skill set that will allow you to determine exactly whether or not the individual lot number of brass that you have is good. Visual inspection. Now this is exactly like it sounds. It was just a visual inspection with your eye. You would grab every single piece of brass and you would look over it. Now the things that you're looking for here are things like creased shoulders or dented or caved in mouths or necks. You can also look at the exterior of the brass and discover whether or not there is any non-uniformities that you can actually see. Because if the brass looks different, there's a chance that it probably is different. Now, you're gonna to have to develop a little bit of a skill set here to determine what is just some like surface level stuff, like maybe a little droplet of oil landed on this brass and it just kind of sat there and it made a little discoloration on the surface versus some sort of a contaminant in that material when they were drawing this brass and, and running it through all their form dyes and whatnot. And you can see that stuff if you look closely. The obvious ones like split necks and uh, creased shoulders and things, if you just run your fingernail around the case, you can oftentimes feel if there's a creased shoulder, it'll catch on your nail. Live fire testing. One of the easiest telltale indicators of a bad batch of brass is that it just simply won't shoot. There'll be nothing that you can do to get it to shoot small. And believe me, folks, the vast majority of brass manufacturers out there are flat out incapable. That means they can not consistently do it. Either they don't have the skill set or they don't have the uh, machinery, but they cannot produce a batch of brass consistently that will shoot sub quarter MOA. Now there's a lot of very beloved brass manufacturers out there that are turning out a product on a regular basis and marketing that product to precision rifle shooters that simply cannot deliver that level of performance. 
So if you can't get it to shoot, that's a pretty good clue. If during live fire, you're seeing a large number of flyers, or maybe even a small number, and you can't otherwise explain it. Now, this is especially true if you're bringing a new batch of brass online for a rifle that you've already been working with. If that rifle is demonstrated to be very consistent and not throw flyers, you introduce a new batch of brass and all of a sudden it's throwing flyers, well, then it's either the brass itself is just metallurgically and, and physically not capable of delivering that level of performance. And what you'll have is it'll be shooting great. And then all of a sudden, maybe one out of 50 or maybe one out of 20 or one out of 10 or something like that will just fly off into the beyond. Brass can cause that all by itself, folks. I mean, it goes without saying that there's a lot of other factors out there that could also give you flyers. Even the best brass in the world will not be able to withstand someone that doesn't understand how to properly use the brass in their various reloading processes. So if you had an extremely poor sizing die or the sizing die was not set up correctly or you're not lubricating correctly or perhaps you're doing something bad to it during the trimming process, there's a lot of things that could cause brass to not shoot well. So don't expect really good brass to perform very well if you don't know what you're doing. Primer seating force. If you're seating primers and you feel a very distinct variation in the force required to put those primers in from one case to the next, that can be an indication that the brass was just simply not of a high metallurgical quality or their forming equipment was not set up properly. And you can have pockets be tighter than the next. And you can discover that when you're pushing a primer in there, if you have one that's seating very hard, next one seats very loosely. It goes without saying that if you're running an overpressure load, then realistically, you're gonna create that variation even with the best brass in the world. It's one thing if you experience this disparity with brand new cases, but if you're on your seventh firing and you've been really pushing that brass hard, well then of course you're gonna have your primer pockets start loosening up and that's probably gonna happen at a non-uniform rate if you're leaning on your brass that hard. Bullet seating force. If you're seating bullets and you notice a great disparity of seating force, that means how much force it's taking to get that bullet in there then it, it could be likely that you have some non-uniform brass. If you're seeing a non-uniform force to get the bullet in there and you're doing all of the bullet seating processes correctly using some very high quality equipment and a very uniform delivery of that force that you're applying while seating, then that bullet seating force variation is probably because of a non-uniformity that exists in your neck material. So this could be a non-uniform hardness. This could be a uh, dimensional variance that you can actually measure. This could be a surface lubricity issue as a function of the friction differential between the bullet and the brass itself. If the inside of the neck of the brass has a varying surface finish, either along the neck from the top to the bottom, or from one side of it to the other, well then that will create a, a force disparity. Now it's important to note here that there are not very many good ways to measure bullet seating force. The way that I measure bullet seating force is with the annealing made perfect press. Now the same company that makes the great annealer, they have this press that allows you to seat bullets and it'll show you not just the force, but it'll show you a graph of where along the bullet seating op that force was. The other methods that are available to detect the bullet seating force, such as a hydro press, those types of things are gonna be very unreliable. You're not gonna be able to get a reading that can really be trusted because those force measurement presses often rely on the insertion velocity so how hard you're pulling on the handle will dictate what kind of force reading that you get. Now, I've previously established on many videos that human beings are very bad at repetition, more so even when we're talking about force repetition. Most people can't even do the same thing the same way a hundred times in a row. They're gonna do something different along the way. But now we're talking about they've gotta do the same thing in the same way with the exact same amount of force and the same amount of velocity. <laughs> so we're stacking more variables on top of what people are obviously not equipped to do in the first place. 
So the force measurements that you get off the various hydro presses out there are simply going to be inadequate to make this determination. The amp press, however, will give you exact measurements because it is using a very static seating velocity. So the speed that it's inserting that bullet is the same every single time. And that allows us to take a, a very specific and very accurate force reading, which can be compared to the other bullets that we've seated and thereby detect a bullet seating force variance. Now, obviously this requires a little bit of understanding of what's going on in order to make the determination of where the bullet seating force variation is coming from. If you have a poorly manicured case mouth, well, that can cause the readings to go all over the place by itself. But when used correctly, you can make a determination during the bullet seating op whether or not the brass is uniform. Then, of course, if you find it to not be uniform, there's a number of corrective actions that you can apply. For instance, we can alter our annealing setting, softening or hardening the brass to our liking to get the bullet seating force and the reduction of the variation that we want. We can also neck turn. Now the astute among you have probably watched my previous videos that I show the amp press in action and we're talking about things like the diameter interference and we're talking about annealing and whether you should do that every firing. And the subsequent questions that came up were, if you're not tuning your diameter interference and changing how your rifle shoots that way, well, then how are you um, making sure that the rifle is going to shoot? And th there is your answer. The astute amongst you probably already figured that out. We can alter how we're annealing the cases and we can alter the thickness of the necks via a neck turning op. That will allow us to alter the amount of force that we're seeing when seeding bullets. Resizing force. Another way that you can detect the uniformity of your brass is just by feeling how much force it takes to resize the brass. And we don't currently have a resizing press that will allow us to take a force measurement to see just how much force we're having to apply to our press in order to get these cases resized. But if we did, that would be a very useful piece of equipment. So for our purposes, it just pays to pay attention and how much you can feel is going to be dependent on how many cycles you do. But if there's a massive disparity in force present here and you can detect it just by your feeling um, and you know that you're putting a uniform lubrication on these cases, this is very critical. If you're not uniformly lubricating them, well, then they're not going to feel the same way in the press, are they? because the surface lubricity between the dye and the brass is going to change from one to the next, dependent on how much lubrication, how fast you're running the press handle, and uh, there's quite a lot of variables here, folks. Loading cycle resilience. Now here is what is possibly the most meaningful of all of the different tests that you could perform to determine whether or not your brass is good, or whether or not you are ruining good brass with a very overpressure load. So subjecting a single piece of brass, now you can maybe do this with two or three pieces if you'd like a more conclusive result because a sample size of one is just generally not a very good indication of anything. But you, you take a single piece of brass to hand load it as many times as you can. By loading a single piece of brass multiple times, basically loading it until failure or until it is past a certain number of firings that you find to be acceptable, is a very easy way to find whether brass is good or bad. If you've worked with this brass from this manufacturer before, and you've established what a very good, workable, mild load is, and you're, you're happy with how the rifle's performing, and you get a new batch of brass online for that same exact cartridge, you can test that lot number by subjecting that single piece of brass to as many firings as it will take, and you can compare that to a previous result that you've done in that same rifle with a different batch of brass. If the number of firings before failure is roughly the same, well then you know you're working with a very similarly quality piece of brass. Now it goes without saying that this test cuts both ways. You can take a very good piece of brass and subject it to overpressure 
and it will not last very many firings at all. So in order for this test to have any meaning, you have to have some higher level experience with this particular cartridge and these components. Because on one hand, the brass can tell you whether or not you're running too much pressure. Because despite the advertised ratings of whatever these cartridges are supposed to be capable of, the individual pieces of brass that you have are the ultimate decider on just how much performance you're gonna be able to get. So the brass could tell you where you're running too hot of a load, or you would be able to detect a bad batch of brass because it would not withstand enough firings. So this, this test cuts both ways and you have to have a, a fair bit of knowledge on what your cartridge should be capable of before you can make the determination. So one easy way to find out whether or not it's something you're doing or whether it's uh, the brass that's, that's not up to standard is to try to use different brass manufacturers. So you grab some brass from several different manufacturers and perform this test seeing how many firings you can get on any of them. And then you'd have a test that's representative of what the entire industry as a whole is capable of in terms of brass manufacture for this cartridge. Because folks, I'm here to tell you that not every manufacturer can produce good brass for every cartridge. Dimensional variance. You can use some form of measuring tool to find out just exactly where the brass is moving during subsequent firings, or you can grab a brand new batch of brass and you can evaluate it just by taking measurements of you know, what class of product did the manufacturer actually deliver. We'll go through a short list here of a few different places and techniques on how to measure your brass. Now, dimensional non-uniformity is an important factor to consider because if it's not dimensionally the same, then you have to ask yourself, well, why is it not dimensionally the same? And the answer generally lies in that either the equipment that they were using to form the brass was being run too fast or was not calibrated correctly, or the maybe the uh, forming equipment itself, the dies and punches and various things, were worn out. And so you've got a dimensional non-uniformity that shows up here as a result of that. So when we're measuring these things, that's what we're looking for here. If the material that they started out with was not of a high pedigree, then it doesn't matter how good their equipment is or how much knowledge they have in trying to run it. The material that they got from their supplier, which folks, this stuff is all melted down at some point. It's like molten metal in a big furnace somewhere. That's kind of how all this stuff starts. So the brass manufacturers themselves have no real control over that. To my knowledge, no brass manufacturer is, is vertically integrated. They are vertically integrated. They you are- mean they walk around with constant erections? No. Where they've got a control from the raw ore coming out of the ground uh, to the finished product. Most of the time they're getting this stuff from a company that's providing the material. These large metal mills that are producing this stuff is, are supplying this material to the market and then the brass manufacturers are just going to the marketplace and buying the material. Oftentimes they'll purchase it in either slug form or maybe discs. Um, it could be just straight sheets, right? And, and they'll come off of a roll and they'll make their own discs in cups. Um, but the point is, is that they don't have a control over the metallurgical makeup of the material. They get the material and then their process starts. So these dimensional inconsistencies, that's what it's showing us. We're getting some way to look at whether or not they were drawn uniformly. And if they weren't, well, then that could be an indication that the material that this brass was made out of is just not very good from the start. It could also be an indication that the brass manufacturer wasn't properly annealing it at certain steps or they weren't properly lubricating it during certain steps. And there's quite a lot of variables and things that can go wrong during the brass manufacturing process. But our measurement of these things can detect these problems. And it is an indication of whether or not the brass is going to continue to be uniform, at least to some degree. As you're out shooting and you're putting cycles on this brass, and so three, four, five, six firings in, you can have these non-uniformities show up. You might not be able to detect them early on, 
but by the time you get to firing number six or 10 or something, well then the non-uniformities may surface at that point because the more work you put on this brass, the more it will show you. This goes back to my suggestion about putting multiple firings on a piece of brass to find out what its failure point is and where its failure point is before you commit to running that particular load in that rifle with you know a thousand pieces of this brass or something. So if the brass is gonna have a plastic deformation of the case head and it's gonna reveal itself either in nasty web expansion that you can measure the bottom portion of the case here that is not really supported by the chamber and doesn't really get touched very much by the resizing die. If that is going to expand greatly and we can measure that, then that could be an indication that the case head is very soft and you might not get the kind of repeatability that you're looking for there. This plastic or non-elastic deformity that's taking place in, in the case head could also be detected on the priming side of things. So that repeated firings is one very easy way to detect whether or not this brass is going to be able to last and be uniform from firing to firing across many firings. One of the places that we can see this metallurgical deficiency or the forming deficiency of the manufacturer's equipment and knowledge is in the case wall thickness uniformity around the entire circumference of the case. So we can use a micrometer such as like a ball mic or something and we can test various different locations around the circumference of the case and by measuring not only around the circumference but kind of up and down on the side of the neck we can get a look at how uniformly the material flowed in their forming dies when they were making these cases. So if you've got a case that has say two or three ten thousandths of variance from one side of the case to the other, then that's an extraordinarily uniform piece of brass. You know, conversely, if you're seeing like a thousandth of, of variance, so if you measure on one side of the case and you jump across to the other side of the case and there's a thousandth of difference there in case wall thickness, then that's typically indicative of a pretty poor batch of brass. When measuring the diameters of the case, you wanna look for not only whether or not it's got a consistent diameter from one piece to the next, but you can also check if the case is oblong or egg-shaped. And the way you accomplish this is by using your measuring tool and then rotating the case while you're measuring it. And if you see that the measurement gets bigger when you rotate the case and then smaller when, when you keep rotating it. Well, the, that's indicative of a not round shape that you're measuring, but it's kind of oblong and a little bit egg shaped. And some of the worst brass manufacturers out there, not only do they have the tendency to produce a very non-uniform wall thickness, but the cases tend to come out a little bit egg shaped too. And the reason for that is obviously that thickness of material disparity from one side of the case to the other, the thicker portions of the case are not going to expand and contract the same way that the thinner portions of the case do. So all of the operations, the expansion that happens during shooting and your subsequent resizing of it and your resizing die later, every time that you manipulate this brass, you're going to be moving parts of the case more than others, and that disparity is gonna show up on target. Primer pockets can be measured pretty effectively with pin gauges and drop indicators. Obviously, the pin gauges would be used to measure the diameter. You have to kind of watch out for uh, egg-shaped primer pockets because obviously the pin gauge won't give you an accurate reading if it's not a round hole, but you can detect it if you've got a pin gauge. The depth of the primer pocket can be measured with our primeware. We have these available on our website, and so you can measure the primer pocket depth as well as the primer heights and your seated primers. And when you're measuring the pockets on this brass, you can also inspect the flash hole, and you can, uh, again, use a small pin gauge, or you can just visually inspect the flash hole. And if you have something like a end-style bore camera, then you can poke it down through the top of the case mouth and you can actually visually inspect the inside of the flash hole as well. Obviously variations here will lead to a variation in ignition and that can be pretty catastrophic if you've got a rifle that otherwise can shoot very good. Your length measurements can be done the overall length with a, a standard caliper. Obviously I'd recommend a very high quality caliper. 
the overall length and the headspace using a headspace gauge of the correct diameter. Wildcatting. When wildcatting, oftentimes we're taking an existing parent case and we're changing the neck diameter in some cases very dramatically. Um, very recently, I put a video on the 20 BRA, and that would be an example of a pretty radical change in, in neck diameter because we started with a six millimeter, right, a 243, and we took that all the way down to 204, 20 caliber. So um, that's like 40 thousandths of movement in diameter. That's a pretty big jump, folks. The brass material up there at the neck is relatively thin. When you're torturing brass like that and moving so much of it, and I only did that in two strokes through the press. So um, that's a big jump. When you're torturing the brass in that way, it will reveal its weaknesses earlier. If you're just grabbing brass that's uh, six BRA and you're shooting it in a six BRA chamber, well, the amount of movement that the brass has to endure is very, very limited in comparison. You're just not asking very much of it, and it, it could take 30 firings to reveal a weakness that when you're wildcatting, you could find that weakness like immediately. The first time you manipulate that case, it would show up. When fire forming, that is also a very violent act, and you're taking that brass and and blowing it out and changing the dimensions of it in a dramatic way. So when doing these types of things, it can be an early warring system to show you, hey, this brass is really not up to this kind of work. It is the kind of testing that I've revealed in this video that has allowed me to make some very objective observations of just exactly what the brass being delivered by the various manufacturers out there is capable of. During this process of using brass from all different manufacturers, I have reached out to several of them and offered feedback on what I thought of their brass and just exactly what it was capable of. And what I found was that there was really only one company that had any intention of making better brass than they currently offered, and that is Alpha Munitions. Now, while that is true, that wasn't always the case. Once upon a time, I tested some brass from Alpha Munitions and it was very poor. The performance that I was getting out of other companies' brass was significantly greater than what I was seeing from Alpha's product. At that time, even they didn't want to hear what I had to say. But it was maybe a year or two years later, I forget exactly how long it was, they had gone through some changes in their company and they reached out and said, hey, we've got another batch of brass. We'd like to send this to you to check out. And when I tested it, I basically was blown off my feet. I just couldn't believe how unbelievably good it was. And I have grown to consider their brass the very best in the world because every single cartridge that I have tested their brass in since that time has been better, and I mean significantly better, than any of the other brass manufacturers in the entire world. The only battle now is to try to get them to offer more cartridges. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in control here, and you're going to give me what I want. You know what it is. Give me what I want. <laughs> I've been asking for it for years. That's not what I want. Give no, me what I, I want. want. You're going to give me what I want, or I'm going to continue to hurt people you love. Because the cartridges that they do make brass for, it is by far and above my number one choice. I could take this opportunity to tell you exactly who to avoid as well. Because it's not just that companies can produce an inferior product, it's that they know they are and they're doing it anyway. I provided feedback to a number of them and literally was ignored flat out ignored. Now it's not like these companies have any obligation to prove to me what their brass is capable of. Now I'm not gonna name these companies because it really serves no point. Me telling you who the best is and pursuing them is going to give them the support that they need to continue offering more different cartridge cases and continue working in this industry to provide the very best brass that they can possibly give us and they've demonstrated that they have a very heartfelt desire from within their organization to do that. Now, I'm not gonna reveal the names of these other companies because there's no point in doing it. I don't want to punish the bad companies, I want to reward the good companies. Now, Alpha Munitions is 
absolutely dedicated to providing the very best shooting brass for the most discerning shooters out there. The other companies, they are either incapable or unwilling. And which one it is, it really doesn't matter, does it, folks? Because if they can't, well, then we can't very well force them to do it. If they are unwilling, that means they just don't want this class of shooter as their customer. Now, for a lot of years, I fought against that. I tried to communicate with these companies. I tried to get them to understand, hey, your product is deficient compared to other companies' products, and you should remedy that. And folks, that's just not a message that most of these people are prepared to receive. They just don't want it. They're not interested in it. They would rather sell a lot higher quantity of brass than a low quantity of very high quality brass. And so it's just a business decision for them, I would imagine. And I don't necessarily begrudge them of that because the pedigree of shooter that Primal Rights and me personally and this channel is dedicated to serving is a extraordinarily small number of shooters that are out there in the marketplace. Most people are just simply not asking for this problem to be solved. So instead of pushing on these companies to improve their product, I have decided to not shoot cartridges that Alpha Munitions doesn't make brass for. Now that's been kind of a difficult transition, but I have been able to mostly successfully do it. Between their Creedmoor offering and their BR, BRA, Dasher offerings, um, that covers a lot of my shooting time. Now, the next cartridge that I hope that they'll make is the 6.5 PRC because Give me what I want. that will take care of all of my PRC primal line of cartridges and wildcats. And uh, then I would really be able to kind of be a, well, okay, I'm only shooting alpha. <laughs> but for now, my secondary choice is Lapua. A lot of you out there know Lapua and they've provided quality cases for a long time. Let's face it, up until this point, up until Alpha was able to do what they've done, um, Lapua, in my mind at least, was the number one offering out there in every case that they produced. Lapua makes 6.5 PRC cases and they also make 300 Norma cases. And those platforms are the parent cases for cartridges that I use in Wildcat form. So I shoot 7 Norma Mag Improved a lot, and that comes from the 300 Norma Mag. And so between Alpha and Lapua, I simply don't shoot anything that they do not provide brass for. I have found shooting other companies' brass at this particular point in time in the making of this video has been a complete waste of my time because the level of shooting that I'm looking for, I simply cannot get from any of the other companies on a regular basis. I know a lot of you are gonna jump in the comments, so what about so-and-so, and what about so-and-so? Uh, folks, I'm just going to flat ignore you because you either watched this portion of the video or you didn't. And even if you did, I'm telling you right now that I'm not gonna just go and condemn some particular brass manufacturer. I'm simply telling you what I'm doing and the kind of performance that I'm happy with, and I'm able to get that from Alpha for sure, and then I'm also able to get it, historically speaking, from La Lapua. And so if Lapua made the case, I'm generally pretty confident in it. Having said that, I still do get, because Lapua is shipped in bulk packaging, and they're all in there banging up against each other, every now and again I'll get a case that simply can't be used because the mouth is completely crushed, inside there, either from the manufacturing process or whatnot. I do see some uh, creased shoulders from the Lapua cases at, at a rate that is significantly higher than that of Alpha. Folks, I'm here to tell you that the vast majority of these companies out there that are producing this product, they are not targeting you. If you're sitting here watching this channel and you are looking for the absolute best, most uncompromising product that can be found, they don't want you. They don't want your business. They don't want you as a customer. You are too demanding. You cost too much. And you're, there's just not enough of us. Now, whether they would openly come out and say that or not, I seriously doubt it. I've spent the last 15 years trying to get a certain level of performance downrange. And I have learned through very hard trial and experience that it this inferior brass just simply will not allow for that kind of performance.
in order to get the kind of performance that I'm looking for, it has to be the very best brass that I can possibly get my hands on because I've found the brass to be one of the most important factors in making all of this work. That's it for today, folks. I hope you had an educational time watching this video. And remember, folks, God is still on the throne. And if you come closer to him and his universal truth, you're very likely to come closer to truth and everything else in your life. God bless, and we'll see you next time.